Oh, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks for that, uh, Bill. It was a pleasure to, uh, to come here. Um, we live in a rather remarkable uh, period of human history. It's been going on for about 500 years. Uh, and it's a, a phase in our history where we have decided to go beyond our senses and start to use uh, instruments that uh, expand our senses. And really when we made that decision in about 1600, uh, I suppose Galileo is one of the most famous examples of, of starting that, we haven't stopped, right? And uh, particularly in astronomy, uh, the decision has always been to get the very best. Right, uh, to get the most expensive, the most accurate, the most prestigious, the most powerful. Uh, and it's a decision that is constantly reenacted uh, throughout time and has led to utterly, utterly remarkable results. Uh, none of these things <laughs> that, that I see on the wall there are visible uh, to the naked eye. Um, and so once a culture makes that decision, um, really rather extraordinary things can start to happen. But I think one thing you might not uh, fully realise is that in part that's a social decision, right? Um, this is not to imply that before about 1600, uh, 1600 uh, people weren't extremely intelligent, they, they, they certainly were. Um, but sometime around about that period, people who were studying the heavens and studying nature decided to have something to do with people who work with their hands, right? And that's a very profound decision because in earlier societies, educated people would not mix, listen to or interact with people who made things. If you made something, you're of lower social class and you had nothing to contribute to the advancement of natural philosophy. So the period I'm going to talk about uh, in the mid-18th uh, century in uh, London uh, is a rather fascinating period because um, the people uh, who are at the forefront of the instrument trade, uh, the great telescope makers, the great uh, angle measure makers, uh, were listened to quite carefully by people uh, who were theoretically capable, mathematically capable, observationally capable. And it's this story I want to tell today, and particularly George Graham, uh, who uh, really had an extraordinary uh, career. So uh, what I'm going to uh, give you uh, tonight uh, comes in part from uh, my book, Perfect Mechanics, uh, and it falls into three parts. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, instrument makers uh, in the 18th century, uh, the specific techniques of making angle measurers, uh, and then one of the most surprising results uh, in 18th century astronomy. Uh, really often I think the, the best kind of discovery is the one that you make them when you weren't looking for it. Um, it's a classic example of a puzzle um, popping out of some very precise, by the standards of the day, extraordinarily precise uh, measurements that revealed a puzzle and out of that puzzle came um, a really rather remarkable um, uh, realisation. Some people say it's the first direct proof that the Earth moves. Um, I'll leave that up to you to decide whether or not that's actually, uh, actually um, the case. Uh, in 1675, a little bit before our story starts, in a desperate race with Christian Huygens over a patent for a spring-regulated watch, Robert Hooke characterised the clockmaker Thomas Tompion as, and I quote, a slug, a clownish, churlish dog, and a rascal, because Tompion was too slow to make a watch that Hooke had designed. It was Hooke's watch, not Tompion's. Robert Hooke was a fellow of the Royal Society, he was the patron, and Thomas Tompion, the shopkeeper, was the client. Fifty years later, Tompion's apprentice, George Graham, similarly made watches, clocks and quadrants for fellows of the Royal Society of London. Yet these were known as Graham's clocks and Graham's quadrants. And language such as Hooke used towards Tompion was inconceivable towards George Graham. He was not only a fellow of the society but also a member of its council and the author of many significant papers. 
And crucially, his testimony on and experiments in astronomy, magnetism, horology, and metrology were unquestioned. And um, after his death, uh, he was buried in uh, Westminster Abbey uh, with an inscription that stated, his inventions do honour the British genius and his accurate performances are the standard of mechanical skill. Yet, in the early decades of the 18th century, you could still go to his shop in London Strand and buy a watch or a clock from him. Uh, if you still own it, you're extremely fortunate. Uh, anyone in the room own any George Grahams? No, no, well, that's a shame. <laughs> I, I don't either. Um, like Tompion, George Graham was a shopkeeper. Now, in the 18th century, um, the words instrument and instrument maker were used rather than the modern term scientific instrument and scientific instrument maker. I mean, when we come to talk about the past, we're often faced with this difficult decision about what language to use, right? So we want to understand what we're talking about. We want to understand um, the past as best we can. But sometimes um, will we use the language that they use and make a kind of a translation or will we impose the language that we use? Um, so, for example, it's a nonsense to talk about scientists before the 19th century who didn't exist. Uh, it was made up really by William Huell. Um, you know, so it, 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 it's good, you, these barriers that, that language can put in front of us. Um, so uh, an instrument maker was usually identified as practicing one of three branches, mathematical, optical, or philosophical instrument making. Um, and uh, these categories did blur a little bit as the um, century uh, progressed. So uh, craftsmen who made mathematical and optical uh, instruments that undergirded the new experimental science flourished, supplying equipment, sometimes giving lectures, and occasionally making contributions to natural philosophy themselves. At the Royal Society, artisans and other non-gentlemen, such as George Graham, spoke for themselves on important topics and with a broad and unfettered intelligence. Rather than languishing like instrument makers at other times and places as invisible technicians, they are at times able to invert the social order and resisting appropriation of their work and prevailing over their social superiors and scientific disputes. So the philosophical patron saint of these sorts of men was uh, Francis Bacon. Does anyone read Bacon anymore? Does anyone read him in high school perhaps? Yeah, uh, he's a marvellous, um, marvellous writer um, and uh, you know, identified with utilitarianism and, and pragmatism and, and the experimental method. Um, he uh, recommended that the best kind of science was a union of thinking and acting, head and hand if you like. Um, and this was seen in the creation of many scientific instruments in uh, London in uh, the 18th uh, century. These instrument makers demonstrated a closer and purer league between the experimental and the rational faculties. And in one of Bacon's wonderful images, he said, uh, thus they resembled his bee, uh, the bee which gathers its material from the flowers of the garden and of the field, but transforms and digests it by a power of its own. In contrast to the ant-like men of experiment who only collect and use, or the spider-like reasoners who make cobwebs out of their own substance. So it's a classic sort of middle way argument, you know, not all theory, not um, just constantly doing the same old thing over and over again without any uh, intelligence. So since instruments are material entities that straddle the scientific and the technical realms, the makers of novel or improved ones had to operate in both worlds to be successful. So they needed enough science to know how and why an instrument worked and also enough technique to put designs into practice. This is not an easy business. Ants and spiders do not casually transform into bees. And the interests, experience, education, proclivities, incomes and social position of experimenters and reasoners do not often overlap. I mean, we still see it today, right? Um, theoretical science, practical science. Um, pure mathematics, um, we used to call practical mathematics, what's it called now, statistics? Sorry, applied mathematics, applied mathematics, yeah. computation, yeah. 
<clears throat> so into the class of the dogged ants, Bacon placed the hidebound mechanic who, not troubling himself with the investigation of truth, confines himself to the attention of those things which bear upon his particular work. But the 18th century mechanics, uh, whom I'm talking about tonight, were very different from those that Bacon described. They did not pile up copies of instruments that were just like those of their fathers or their masters to whom they had been apprenticed. They sent out to improve themselves and their artefacts. In fact, one label historians have used for 18th century Europe is, is the age of improvement, so constant devotion um, to uh, improvement. They were scientifically astute and mechanically brilliant. And like Bacon's bees, they gathered the raw pollen of their scientific and technical knowledge and transformed it into the honey of an improved science. Unlike other tradesmen who proved unable or unwilling to provide the Royal Society or other scientific societies with detailed, or in some cases any, accounts of their various trades, instrument makers stood to gain much from advertising their skills and wares before the fellows. Elite instrument makers were thus similar to the painters and sculptors for whom success, according to Sir Joshua Reynolds in his 1776 address to prize-winning students at the Royal Academy, um, depended not only on the industry of the hands but of the mind. As our art is not a divine gift, so neither is it a mechanical trade. Its foundations are laid in solid science. So just as artists could not rely on skill alone, um, instrument makers at the very highest level could not rely on products or make products that were merely mechanical. That is to say, made without thought or invention. They too um, needed to have foundations laid in solid science. And their virtues, dexterity, exactness, respect for empirical truth, were thought to typify one particular strand of British pragmatism. Uh, how many of you been to Greenwich Observatory in, in England? Oh, great, quite a lot of you. I, I, I don't know how many of you would have wandered around and looked at one of the 19th century buildings there, um, brick building. And, and if you look up, there are all these names inscribed around uh, there. Um, and uh, at the four points of the cross are the bullocks of English positional astronomy, right? So you've got Flamsteed, Bradley, Masculine and Airy. So they're the astronomer royal. You'd expect to see them there. Not terribly um, surprising. And then in, in between, you see the telescope makers, Dolland, uh, achromatic lens, Herschel, great reflecting telescopes. The quadrant makers, Graham, Bird and Ramsden. The chronometer makers, Harrison, Arnold and Earnshaw. So they're literally next to the, the great observers and their names are inscribed in, in the building itself. And uh, they are there because of their mechanical and uh, intellectual um, brilliance. <coughs> Okay, so that's a little bit about situating instrument makers in, in, in the 18th century in, in London. Now I want to talk about uh, angle measurers uh, and how uh, they were um, made. Uh, and in some senses, it's, it's, it's a quite a simple process uh, and based on um, some very uh, simple uh, geometric um, theorems. So uh, instrument makers used, mathematical instrument makers, used Euclidean straight edge and compass constructions to carry out three basic operations. Uh, drawing a line segment, connecting any two points, extending a line segment, and drawing a circle with any given point as a centre and any given line segment as a radius. So they're very basic uh, geometrical ideas. Yet these constructions are themselves mechanical as Newton pointed out in his preface to the Principia. And I quote, The description of straight lines and circles, which is the foundation of geometry, right, appertains to mechanics. The better the instrument maker, the straighter the lines, and the more perfect the circles. And Newton himself wrote, If anyone could work with the greatest exactness, 
he would be the most perfect mechanic of all, right? So in order to make an accurate angle measurer, you want, uh, they're not all circular, of course, they're often portions of circles, quadrants often, um, but you want a, as accurate a uh, circle inscribed on uh, the metal. Um, and uh, when, uh, again, Newton wrote, when the beginner has mastered the art of precision, he may approach the threshold of geometry. And with the tools of geometry, reduce the art of measuring to exact propositions and demonstrations. Now, all these people realised that they were just approaching the ideal. I mean, they knew, of course, that um, uh, all the ideas of geometry are just that. They are ideas and, indeed, ideals. Um, you know, the, the, the line has no dimension, but, of course, you know when you're inscribing a line on a straight edge or for using a compass, of course, you know that has a dimension. Um, so they, they, they do realise they um, cannot uh, approach um, utter, utter perfection. Um, so to be effective, they had to both be very uh, careful, have an exact mechanical execution, and also an intellectual grasp of uh, mathematical theory. Now Graham himself, George Graham, who was flourished from the 1720s through to the 1750s, um, demonstrated the virtues of mixing mechanical brilliance with a sound understanding of geometry when he made fine divisions of angles down to the last second. So with um, the uh, telescope um, uh, 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 enabling you to see things precisely, uh, and when you line them up, you, you're then going to look down and see... A, what angle um, you're, you're reading, um, getting that finer and finer and finer uh, is going to lead to um, all sorts of uh, rewards. Uh, he, his zenith sector um, was particularly uh, famous, and we'll be talking about that um, in, um, in uh, a minute. Um, you may also have seen Graham's Quadrant if you've been um, to, to, to Greenwich. Uh, and it was um, famous in its day. It cost 500 pounds, uh, and <laughs> a rather extraordinary um, George Graham himself was on the committee that reported on the uh, quadrant that he made, um, a little, little unusual. Um, but uh, in an age of much corruption, um, it seems that George Graham, who had the nickname Honest George Graham, uh, lived up to his name. For the observatory not only got its quadrant, uh, it got a quadrant that was indeed of unparalleled accuracy. Uh, one commentator, Robert Smith, uh, wrote a book on optics, um, asserted that its particular accuracy excels all others owing to the extraordinary skill and contrivance of Mr George Graham. And even 50 years later, 1780s, Neville Masculin called it excellent of a degree of inaccuracy known before. While another Cambridge Don, William Ludlam, thought that Graham had carried the art of constructing and graduating this instrument to such perfection that from this time we may date a new era in astronomy. Um, now, uh, Alan Chapman has uh, done some lovely work on um, dividing uh, the circle. And uh, Graham's importance lay not only in the delicacy with which he divided the arc using standard geometric techniques. Uh, the very simplest one is to, 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 to bisect a line. You, you do one um, part of a compass line and another part of a compass line and then the where the two lines intersect. When you run through that, that bisects the point where you had each compass. Um, so you can always bisect um, a line um, reasonably uh, well. Uh, he introduced a, he used a vernier scale and uh, he used a compass um, and uh, he used a 96 part scale uh, cross-checked against the 90 degree scale because rather unfortunately for us if, if you're in the dividing business you, you wish you didn't have 90 degrees you, you wish you had 96 degrees and a quarter because you just keep halving it and you can keep going down and down uh, uh, and going um, 
So uh, Chapman describes Graham's bisection technique as follows. Uh, so from the zero point, the radius compass could strike off 60 degrees. On the Euclidean principle that a radius is a chord, will divide into a full circle six times exactly. The 60 degree space was then accurately bisected with a shorter compass um, in, in the way uh, that um, I uh, just described. Uh, Graham actually used a strong magnifier um, to see where the lines um, touched each other. Uh, and then once the 30 degree point had been found, the compass was set into the 60 degree mark and thereby a full 90 degree arc was constructed and then bisected the 30 degree bits into 15s. <coughs> After uh, getting down uh, to the 15 degree um, arc by bisections, he copied that arc onto another piece of brass and to trisect, he used another compass, which he then set to an estimated one-third division of the 15-degree arc. Um, and I can, uh, you can read more about this uh, from uh, Chapman. Um, so these methods uh, after the bisection w were tedious and, and not geometrically pure. Um, and uh, this is why the cross-checking against the 96-degree um, quarter circle was uh, very, very uh, useful. <clears throat> so the key there is the extremely accurate and extremely fine uh, divisions of these angles. Um, and fortunately, if you're in the angle measuring business, um, the change in temperature doesn't really matter. Um, because everything expands symmetrically, um, so it doesn't alter the angles that you're um, reading uh, on, on the uh, uh, instrument. In order to get uh, a high level of uh, credence with other um, natural philosophers at the Royal Society, instrument makers had to establish their credentials, not only as makers, but also as trustworthy observers, and typically they would do this uh, in um, astronomy. Um, one common way of doing that was uh, with um, eclipses. So for example, in 1722, um, Edmund Halley uh, observes an eclipse of the sun on November the 27th uh, in Greenwich, and George Graham did the same uh, in uh, central uh, London. Now, by the 1720s, nearly two centuries after the death of Copernicus, another phenomenon that was a necessary and very well accepted consequence of the Copernican system, stellar parallax, had not yet been proved by observation. Well, it's slightly embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's a very tiny effect. Um, there's no a priori way of knowing how tiny it is until you eventually um, find it. That makes a given star seem to move slightly against the general stellar background throughout the year as the Earth orbits the Sun. To explain away the lack of an observed parallax, astronomers argued, correctly I might add, in the early 18th century, that the parallax is just too small to be seen with current instruments. And hence, by um, implication and calculation, the closest star, also true, was very distant from the sun. Uh, and I'm sure you all know that um, it took about another 100 years into... When's Bessel's 1820s, I think? Uh, his, his work, uh, when, when finally it's observed, nearly 300 years later after um, Copernicus. It's quite a quite a time, to, quite a long time to wait, isn't it, to get a direct proof of one of the consequences of the Copernican system. There's a similar problem actually with uh, circulation of the blood, right? Because you, you can see the veins in the arteries, but it's damn difficult to see the capillaries. And um, in fact, I forget when capillaries are first seen, but considerably later than Harvey. Uh, another case, it had to be there because how did the blood get from the artery to the vein but you, you couldn't see them for quite a long time. 
so that's the background in which it was generally believed that you just had to make more and more accurate instruments. People were looking for the parallax. They wanted to demonstrate that which they knew had to be true. And so James Bradley, who was the Astronomer Royal at the time at Greenwich, turned to George Graham to construct such a device. And they, they both genuinely hoped that they would find the parallax. That was their explicit um, aim uh, to... Um, uh, make this New Zenith sector. And I'm going to tell you right out, that was a complete failure. They did not find the parallax, right? So this is a story of failure, uh, but an interesting failure. So the zenith, I'm just le lecturing to the converted here, the, the zenith is the point directly over the observer's head, and the meridian is the plane that passes through the zenith and the Earth's axis. So the sun passes through the meridian at midday and all other stars pass at slightly different times of day, returning to the same time after a year. One December night in 1725, while looking for the parallax, Bradley noticed that a star crossing the meridian near the zenith was three seconds more southerly than he had expected. Now that isn't very much by... 18th century standards um, by the, this time period uh, in the 1720s. Although three seconds is a very small amount, and just to give you an idea, uh, Tico Bra is Tico Brahe up there? No, he didn't didn't get a didn't get a look in up there. Um, uh, often thought to be one of the best naked eye observers uh, in the history of astronomy. Uh, his best observations were some 60 times less accurate, that is to say only good to a few minutes of degree, not, not uh, seconds. Bradley firmly believed that Graham's instrument was at least this accurate, right, accurate down to the last second, so to speak. So he continued for an entire year to measure the angle at which the star passed through the meridian. Since the star was near the zenith, Errors due to the refractive effect of the atmosphere were not that significant. He also took account of the precession of the equinoxes when uh, calculating the change in the star's position. During that year, the star first continued in a southerly direction, then moved northerly and finally returned to its original position in December of 1726, a year later. You've got to admire these guys, so they take a long-term view. <laughs> stick, it out, stick it out for a year. Which Bradley took, and I quote, sufficient proof that the instrument had not been the cause of this apparent motion of the star. Right? So he's got two reasons to assume that the completely unexpected phenomenon was not an instrumental artifact. Firstly, the star returned to its original position exactly after one year. Right? Which implies the phenomenon was most likely caused by the annual motion of the Earth. Secondly, and perhaps more compelling for Bradley, Graham's sector produced errors much smaller than the phenomenon itself. Um, one thing you've got to understand about this period is absolutely no concept of statistical control or, or error or, or, or anything like that. Uh, in fact, um, it, it, there's a sort of sense of moral strength right, and support People just are very, very careful, but people are not analysing um, statistical variation, the personal equations 100 years away. Um, so th there, there is a sense that you're getting closer and closer and closer, but not without the sense of the kind of statistical um, variation. So the way in which Bradley thought that, that Graham's sector produces Error is much smaller than the phenomenon itself. It's almost a moral judgment. It's, it's not one that he reached through close statistical analysis. Hence, we can be well assured from the perfections of our instruments, right? So it's essential that this is an unprecedentedly high-quality instrument. We can be well assured from the perfections of our instruments, of the limits wherein the error of our observations are contained, and again, the error is not statistical. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a different notion um, of error. And we need not hesitate to ascribe such apparent changes as manifestly exceed those limits to some other causes. Okay, So it's a real effect. It's annual. Uh, 
what's what's causing it. Confident in the perfection of Graham's instrument and putting aside all thoughts about the cause, right? Uh, this is the mark of a good experiment in this era. Um, Bradley set out to acquire the proper means to determine more precisely what exactly the phenomenon was. And the proper means is a new and even more precise zenith sector made by George Graham. Uh, a more perfect instrument than any had, had preceded it. Twelve and a half feet long, and it's very big. And Graham did not build it himself, but he carried out the most delicate work, dividing the arc and setting the micrometer screw in the crosshairs of the telescope. Bradley believed that this instrument was anchored down to half of a second. That's quite extraordinary for that era. And he settled, elected 12 stars near the zenith and settled down for another year's observation before <laughs> attempting to hypothesize on the cause. Right? They, these guys, classic Baconian, um, not mindless experimentation. I mean, this observation is highly structured and, and very, very um, you know, precise. But um, facts first, theory second. <laughs> Bradley hypothesized after this second year that the phenomenon he'd observed could only be caused by the relative motion of the Earth with respect to the stars, right? It's quite a subtle argument. If a telescope on the Earth were pointing directly overhead of the star and the Earth were moving past the star, then the light entering the top of the telescope would not reach the bottom since the telescope would have moved past the star. Right? It's a very, very subtle effect. Um, they knew that the speed of light was um, a fixed amount um, and they had reasonably good estimates of uh, what it was. On the other hand, if the telescope were inclined ever so slightly from the vertical by an angle equal to the ratio of the Earth's speed to the speed of light, okay, the starlight entering the top of the telescope would get to the eyepiece in the bottom as the Earth moved past the star. And it's a fairly simple argument. Bradley allegedly solved the puzzle, and this feels a bit sort of after the fact. He mentions it though, he says this is what struck him. After he had had, uh, after making all these observations, when on a boating trip he noticed that the flag on the boat's mast moved as the boat went about, even though the wind direction had not changed. Right? From this he concluded that the relative motion of the boat brought about an apparent change in the wind direction as measured by the flag. Therefore, by analogy, the relative motion of the earth brought about an apparent change of the star's position as measured by the telescope. Oh, sorry, I'm wrong. Um, the, the, the other commentators, Bradley himself, doesn't doesn't tell that story. Popularizers of astronomy later in the century used another analogy, perfectly suited to Northern Europe and particularly Britain, namely likening the phenomenon to walking in the rain with an umbrella. The faster you walk, the more you must incline your umbrella to avoid getting wet. Okay. So it's just the relationship between the speed of the earth and the speed of light. Okay. Likewise, the faster the earth moved, the more inclined the telescope would have to be to collect the light in its eyepiece. Bradley observed that over a year, the star traced out a small ellipse around its expected position. And from the size of this ellipse and the star's latitude, he calculated the sun's light took 8 minutes and 13 seconds to reach the Earth. That's quite good, isn't it? What, what's the modern number? What's that? Five. <laughs> 8 minutes 20. Yeah, he hisses 813. Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Halley, who at this point was a very old man, regarded these curious observations and reflections that lay behind the establishment of the aberration of starlight to be among the, one of the most remarkable events in the history of astronomy. Hmm. 
It's kind of incredible, really. No one had, had hypothesized that this would be the case. I mean, it's not actually that complicated after the fact. Not one, Halley stated, but three grand doctrines in modern astronomy to receive a great light and confirmation from this one single motion of the star's light. Viz. One, the motion of the Earth, the motion of light, and the immense distance of the stars from the sun. Furthermore, this was the very best kind of discovery because it had been made accidentally, which meant that the observer was not trying to prove any pre-existing hypothesis. Nature had been caught unawares by a new and precise instrument. Right? Couldn't ask for a better discovery. Bradley clearly believed that natural philosophy could be improved by increases in observational accuracy. 20 years later, in a paper of 1748, demonstrating the very subtle phenomenon of the nutation of the moon's axis, he would more explicitly espouse this conviction. Kepler had relied on Brahe. Newton could not have philosophized without the invention of clocks and telescopes. And therefore, theory is indebted to practice for many of its inductions. And it's quite an interesting point um, that you, you can't even have theories about some things without instruments. And of course, um, just think of modern nuclear physics. Um, you, you can't have any of these theories without these extraordinary instruments that help you think about them. Um, yeah. All these instances, Bradley concluded, point out to us the great advantage of cultivating in this, as well as every other branch of natural knowledge, a regular series of observations and experiments. Bradley gave a glowing testimonial to his friend, the man, and I quote, who above all, above all others has most contributed to the improvement of astronomical instruments, our worthy member, fellow of the Royal Society, George Graham. And this is what he said about Graham. If my own endeavours have in any respect been effectual to the advancement of astronomy, it has principally been owing to the advice and assistance given to me by Graham, whose great skill and judgement in mechanics, joined with a complete and practical knowledge of the uses of astronomical instruments, enable him to contrive and execute them in the most perfect manner. This is an extraordinary encomium from a gentleman, an Oxford professor, to an artisan and a London shopkeeper. Not only was Bradley reliant upon Graham for supplying what he called perfect instruments, but he acknowledges that Graham assisted him in making observations and possibly in interpreting them, although we're not sure. Although mathematical instruments usually measured existing phenomena, Bradley and Graham together used the zenith sector to reveal unexpected new truths in natural philosophy. Thank you. Fantastic question. I don't know where to start with. Um, the Greek um, astronomer Aristarchus actually proposed the Copernican system back in those days, and he also um, um, believed that the stars were at extreme distances, but he had no instruments to base it on. It was purely philosophical reasoning that he thought the sun was the most magnificent object, so it made sense that everything orbited the sun. So it's quite interesting that it, these ideas had actually been thought of in the distant past without any real you know, measurement or anything to back it up. Yes, I mean, um, the... You know, the, the, the Copernican system only really took hold when the a physics was created to make it plausible. Um, so until Galileo comes along, um, if you should read Galileo, I mean, probably not in Italian, but, but I mean, in, in some lovely translations, but, um, uh, you know, he finally makes it plausible that you can be moving and not feel it, right? And um, because on the face of it, it's a ridiculous assertion. <laughs> Probably rubbish Aristarchus's idea yeah. because he said if the Earth was spinning, then all the, all the 
That's Water right. and air would Correct. flow off into space. That's right, because um, that was the predominant physics of, 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 of the day. Um, but also the predominant cosmology, um, and of course that was strengthened within Christian theology, you, you have the earth at the centre um, and go out to the heavens. So it's extremely difficult to move away, move away from that. Um, but yeah, absolutely, you can speculate as much as you like. <laughs> um, but it, it takes a while. Um, and you can make the Ptolemaic system work. Um, you just keep adding epicycles. I mean, you can make that sucker work. Uh, I, I mean, it, it comes a point at which it gets very creaky, but um, yeah, you, it, 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 it's, it's not that that killed it off. And in fact, um, the moon is way worse than the Copernican system. It's a pig. Uh, whereas the moon's very easy in the <laughs> in the Ptolemaic system, yeah. So um, it, not not every aspect of Copernicus is is even at that mathematical level necessarily superior. Can you maybe explain a little bit more about how this measurement actually happened? Because it's no accident that they were clockmakers and Um, well, I think the two are in concert with each other, yeah. Um, I mean, if you didn't have very precise angle measurements um, and your vernier scales and things like that, then you couldn't get down to um, seconds. Um, if you didn't have telescopes mounted uh, on uh, the arms, then you can't get a really you know, precise crosshair measurement. And then, yeah, if you don't have the pendulum clocks, uh, with with their accurate reasonably accurate times, then you're also going to run and you're not going to be able to, to do this. Um, but they 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 focused on the angles that that it was the the, the fact that you're picking up these minuscule minuscule differences over time. Mm. That's the. Wonderful. Down in the basement. Yeah. And uh, was handed on eventually to, it was owned by a guy called Bartlett, who was an instrument maker, clock maker, and so on in Auckland. And uh -huh. He used to use the transit telescope to uh, regulate ship chronometers. Right. So it was right. against yeah. the law for a ship to leave all yeah. of the yeah. harbour without yeah. its yeah. certification of its chronometer. That's right. For I mean, good reason. Yeah. It was all, all part of this larger nexus of timekeeping and navigation and map making. And, um, I mean, that's what drove it ultimately was the, the the demand of the state for that level of accuracy, and then the to be able to replicate it through well, ultimately through chronometers. Mm. And that, that was friend daughter eventually brought along and gave cool. it to Professor Sir Percy Burbridge. Oh, okay, okay. Who was one of the founders of the Astronomical Society and eventually wonderful. So do you reckon that is the first proof that the Earth moves? Direct, direct proof, right? Because up till then, right, there's no parallax. It wasn't measured. Um, Foucault's pendulum, you know, that's that's 19th century as well. Um, you know, it, 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 d the direct proof that the Earth moves. Quite tricky. <laughs> it's quite. Um, so some, some people regard, I mean, I suppose it depends on your perspective, but some people regard this as the first direct proof that the Earth moved. Um, yeah. But I, I don't know, I don't know what you, what, what, uh, what you think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Provided you sign on for the basic concept that it's not 
levered, and so the, the earth's moving under it. <laughs> but uh, once you once you agree that that's what's going on, then yeah, it's quite decisive. Yeah. Again, very simple idea. Um, it's often the simple ones that take a while. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's very simple when you when you think about it. Yeah. The other thing about when they finally did um, get to measure parallax, the, the instrument used was not being used for its intended purpose. That they used a device called a heliometer, which was intended for measuring the diameter of the sun, which was of great interest at the time, because obviously it changed as the Earth orbited the sun. Um, because the distance between the Earth and the Sun mm. was changing. So they wanted to measure it really accurately So because they could calculate the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, mm. among some other things. And um, Brad, not Brad, uh, Bradley, I mean Bessel, yes. realised that the accuracy of this thing was enough to be one step better than oh. whatever had been used for annual measures yeah. before, and he succeeded in measuring stellar par parallax using it. Got a question from the internet as well. So sure. this is from John Drummond. Um, Hi, John. <laughs> and he says, can you comment on the micrometers used in double star observing? No. <laughs> 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 I, I wish I could, mate. Um, uh, what, what's motivating that question? Do we know? Don't know. I have to wait for him to respond. There's okay. a few seconds delay okay. on the stream. So, um, yeah, so John, if you could... Uh, Give us a little bit more information on that one, and I'll get Richard to ask him. I can't guarantee an answer. If, if Graham didn't make one, then maybe I don't know about it. <laughs> that's, that's the problem of being a store, and you, you, you only you know. Yeah, they had a micrometer that adjusted a movable slit or something. The, um, yeah, I mean, because these bodies were orbiting each other, so of course that's why they're wanting to measure the separation of double stars. Okay. I mean, true double stars, like oh, that not, not just chance alignments oh. of two stars. They were actually oh, known to be orbiting each other. Okay, well, that's not 18th century. No, 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 no that's, that's well, okay. no. Well, it's, Whoa, really? No, no, it's 18. It was 19th century. That yeah, pretty late, in 19th century. Yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's not that old. It's not that old. Yeah, it's not that old. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah no, that's that's after my time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. So Alpha Centauri and uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, I mean the the um, yeah they they don't have that level of uh, discrimination at that time. Yeah, no, Grant answered his question. <laughs> Thanks, Grant. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Grant. Don't know what we do without you, mate. <laughs> When I was a, a young schoolboy doing tech drawing and, and bisecting circles yeah. with my compass, I was always frustrated by the fact that it never made exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> given the flexibility of my compass and yeah, yeah, yeah. the accuracy of putting my point in the middle yeah, of the line that yeah. I described. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm amazed that the, yeah. the, the, the skill must have been phenomenal. Yeah. That they, they, they were, I mean, they were artists, you know, they were like the Leonardo da Vinci's of, of their profession. I mean, they're extraordinary. Graham, um, you know, they, they, when they talk about him, they said this incredible touch. He seemed to have this capacity just to feel very tiny differences with his fingers, um, unusual eyesight. Um, Herschel had very unusual eyesight, it would appear. I mean, you know, they're, they're just very unusual people. And... Um, and you know, well, he was trained by Thomas Tompion, so he'd probably learned a bit from him. Um, yeah, it, 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 uh, you know, it's an apprenticeship system, um, and it, you know, it's part of their livelihood. So they, you know, they really focused on it. Whereas you're just dicking around in school with some fifty cent compass. I mean, you know, it's just, it's, 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 well, yeah, yeah, it's not going to cut it. <laughs> um, some of these compasses were huge um, because you know they were big bloody arcs. If you've got a twelve foot scene, a twelve and a half foot scene a sector, I mean, it's huge, uh, and, and that helps the precision as well, making them bigger. Yeah, 
Because I mean, if you think about, you know, we had a, a, a compass that was this diameter, yeah. and you think of what a degree looks like, yeah. and you're dividing yeah. that into 3,600. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. have a big compass. Isn't yeah, it? that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you have this glorious feature that it doesn't matter what the temperature is when you're working on it, because for other sorts, like if you're working on a pendulum, I mean, uh, you know, you, you, you know, some of these instruments you have to have everything the same temperature. You can't work on it in a cold morning and then work on it on a warmer afternoon. Whereas with the angle measures, it doesn't matter. Because mm. my other comment was, I wonder what they would make of an instrument like LIGO, measuring to, you know, <laughs> 10 to the minus 20 of a metre. I mean, it's a different sort of measurement. Yeah. I, look, I, I, I just think they'll, they would say, um, yep. You know, I mean, they, they, they would grasp the principle pretty quickly, and then they just want to know how the hell you do it. I mean, obviously, electronics is completely outside that. I mean, the electrical age is so remarkable. I mean, we're so in, in it, we don't even think about it. But there was no such thing yeah. until about 1800 with the battery. We've only had it for about 200 years. You know, we, volts didn't exist, you know, until you have a battery that can <laughs> make voltage. You know, it, 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 it's, it's incredible, really. Yeah. It's incredible. the accuracy of, of time with GPS, you think of... How accurate this device is from Extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, it always blows my mind that Einstein's general theory of relativity matters for GPS. I go, wow. <laughs> you know, the Earth doesn't have that much gravity. You know, it shouldn't really make that much difference. You know, but it, it you know, it's so precise. But that's that's the, you know, that's what they started this devotion to precision. Um, it, you know, it's not obvious that will that it will have benefits. It could just be some sort of very finicky, annoying sort of, you know, strange quirk of, of, of people. But no, it, it's, it's just this never-ending yield that comes from a devotion to both accuracy and precision. And, and these guys are right in the thick of it. But it, we're, we're, there's a real change with, um, well, Bessel's part of it, but, you know, with Euler... Um, Laplace statistical analysis it slowly starts to dawn on people that you know you can't just sort of train people up and make them more and more precise that and and have a kind of a moral um, uh, component that, that 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 there's a natural scatter and you you've got to control in fact the the whole story of the personal equation is absolutely fascinating um, because um, one astronomer royal sacked a whole bunch of his assistants because he thought they were useless. <laughs> but it, it, it was just the personal equation going on. And, and once people figure that out, then you can adjust for it. Um, and it's not a moral failing that you see something crossing that cross there. It's slightly, I mean, and, and we're always in the same manner, you see it slightly differently from someone else. And then you can control for it once you observe those variances and, and then when, it, when you control for it, you can get rid of it through the statistics. Nothing like that in this era. In, in this era, it's, you're just getting better and better and better and better. Yeah. Um, and so that commitment to precision is very important, whereas now we live... I mean, it's, it's odd. We're in this mixture of very precise but very statistical as well. Um, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the, astronomy, the, um, the best measurements by the guy satellite around the order of micro arc seconds mm. or maybe 10 micro arc seconds something which is pretty incredible normal. but they would love it man they would just love it you know they're in a, <laughs> yeah I, I mean the LIGO thing I remember being told about oh well, this is possible and this you know I was doing physics and and they said oh but it'll never happen because it's just too <laughs> too hard so when it did happen I said man that's fantastic it's just unbelievable yeah so um do you know whether um, their idea of perfect time yeah. is any different to our idea of perfect time? Is there any is there any evidence to suggest that that? I mean, I know we, we can narrow narrow time down electronically and right. mathematically yeah. and all the rest of it. But was their time any different? Yes, it was because they thought that the Earth was a perfect clock. So um, you compared your clocks against the Earth to discover how 
accurate they were, right? Whereas we've gone past that now. Our clocks we use to measure the rotation of the Earth, and we can demonstrate that because of tidal um, forces, with you know making a bit of heat, the Earth's slowing down slightly. So um, that's been quite a fundamental move. We've moved away from the spinning Earth. Uh, as our clock, that no longer is our clock. Um, just as we've moved away from the, you know, that piece of platinum in Paris or something that had two little lines on it. I mean, oh, you know, it's crazy. I mean, <laughs> could be, you, know, you know, when you start to think about it, it can't be a, 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 a stable unit because I mean, you know, how fat are those inscriptions? You know, the the little lines that you draw. I mean, you're trying to make them finer and finer, but each time you'd make a new one, it's moving around a little bit. So it's it's not a standard, um, ultimately. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it's no, it's no good for physics. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so we we've moved away in in all these ways from you know natural measures to. Uh, uh, you know, hang on, I'm gonna be careful here. We've settled upon natural measures that don't have a variance, whereas the, the, the earlier natural measures that we settled upon, it turns out, are variable. So they're no good as standards. So I, I don't know if that's answered your question about about time. Um, but time's deeply mysterious. I mean, I, do we even measure it? I mean, we count it out, but measure it? I don't know. Anyway... Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much for that presentation. Oh, it's fun. Lovely to talk to you all. Sure. <laughs>